next talk is Oliver Sauder, um, also a very good friend. And uh, Oliver is the person that years ago started to talk me about a new way to incorporate um, a project, whether it's a startup, an organization, in a way that is not, uh, let's say, so heavily prescribing and, and, and constricting and predefined like, let's say, a cooperative, which a lot of people, especially in our uh, culture uh, tend to orientate themselves to um, um, but something that it's still conserving actually allow you much more creativity in terms of what kind of uh, rules you want to you want to you want to embed in in, in this organization while having something that is uh, uh, also mm, more we're basically where the people that are actually producing value inside this organization, they are the one that also are uh, owning the, uh, let's say, the financial destiny of the of this organization. And um, we've been talking lately, especially in the last year, how this is something that is not only relevant for just any project, because it allows you to make something that is ethical, but also uh, lean and easy as opening a normal game BA in Germany that would be or a Uge that would be in Germany the kind of a limited company um, but also how it's particularly relevant for uh, collaborative ecosystems like the one we are seeing emerging in the web tree domain so where actually an organization needs to to collaborate if if they wants to develop interoperable infrastructure but the advantages are so much more and I let um, Oliver to uh, share his talk with, with us and uh, we can come back when, it, when it's done to have a little reflection together. So Oliver, it's, the stage is all yours. Thank you very much, Yuji. You can share um, your... Let me share my screen. So... You can see the screen now in full, right? We can see the screen in full and we can also, yes. <clears throat> yeah, um, I'm Oliver and I incorporated a company called Worldbrain with the steward ownership model. And maybe saying incorporation is maybe not the right term. Um, the steward ownership in itself is a social contract that is like made between investors and team members and primarily in how to reward people participating in the company or taking the risk. Um, and if you like to also adding some governance structures. So a cooperative is in a way a steward owned company with very specific rules. Um, but I'll come to why this is the case in a second. So if we're thinking about the problem of um, theft of attention and data, we all know these examples of Facebook, like building this entire machinery uh, to optimize uh, targeting of ads to you and selling it off to third parties. Um, so, or you may, some of you have seen the social dilemma, which um, like points out how these algorithms are optimized for sucking in your attention. Um, and the root cause I don't see necessarily in um, like capitalistic um, structures or the necessity to make profit. Uh, the root cause I see that uh, the current investor reward models, um, investors essentially have uh, uh, get more profits if the company makes more profits or grows in value. And there is really no cap on how much that can be. And in the end, uh, what that means is that um, there's always a competition and a need, a competition for a social responsibility and a need for a company to build more exploitative algorithms, uh, to build uh, or incorporate business models that can neglect the, the, the externalities, the costs that are created in society, um, uh, in, in the environment, for example, too. So, Except here, there are other uh, unaccounted externalities um, if there's constant competitive dynamic between the profits that the company gets um, and the, the costs that it would that would occur in order to pay your workers better, uh, to, to uh, improve your supply chain sustainability, 
or to adopt a business model that does not require uh, to sell off data or um, build the most tension grabbing algorithms there they are out there. Um, so there's what we want to figure out is a way of where can we give a company more social, the more more economic freedom for social um, responsibility. And it's actually, um, oh yeah, so one other issue is if you have um, kind of an optimization towards profit maximization over time, you will always end up with an, an, an immense amount of wealth inequality. And you cannot stop it because the, the rich have more means and less risk to invest more money. Um, and then essentially over time, it will just create this kind of wealth inequality. And interestingly, this is an interesting um, fact um, factoid I found out and where I'm still not sure um, where I see like cryptocurrencies really making those economies more cent decentralized. Because if we're looking, for example, on the on Bitcoin and the wealth distribution in Bitcoin, which is, by the way, according to this um, these lists and this data, uh, one of the more decentralized, economically decentralized uh, communities. We have the top 0.01% of the US um, owning 12% 12 of the wealth. In Bitcoin, is 42%. Of course, there's also some whales or bigger exchanges that hold some of those wallets, but still, there is a, even if it's, even if it's half, um, the, the amount of uh, centralization of economic power um, ha has been at a really breakneck speed in this case. Um, and what we hope for is that we figure out a way of uh, this is, for example, the, the, the talks that UJ and me had in the past year about how can we tokenize um, steward ownership and, and use the advantage of um, like cryptocurrencies becoming, having, having a force, being a force of decentralization by enabling more access to people um, that usually are locked out of financial markets and that can't go to um, buy stocks on the stock market. But still, we need to figure out um, how we not repeat the same um, uncapped uh, investor returns that lead to the kind of maximization incentives um, in those e communities. And weirdly, it's also quite of um, an antithetical uh, economic approach uh, when you think about that the decentralization community wants to build more decentralization, uh, more decentralization into an economy, but deploy economic reward mechanisms, speculation mainly in this case, um, to that, that hyper centralize. So it's something that I'm very wary about, and um, I hope we can have more of those conversations into crypto communities that effectively try to decentralize power. So what we want from an, from an alternative model of rewarding investors is that extractive actors can turn into regenerative actors. Um, and this means we also need to reduce the ability for executing on greed as much as possible. And what we also need here is that um, this alternative economic model has an economic freedom built in for social responsibility. So lower costs and higher costs and lower profit for the, for the company does not necessarily mean lower return for investors. Um, then secondly, we also need a fair reward of effort. And this is what I believe is the great part about um, capitalism as we know it, is that it incentivizes people to actually do more um, and uh, take risks. And this is what we need. We need to have a certain level of growth in order to progress forward and actually solve most of the challenges that we have right now. But the question that we never ask ourselves or that is not explicitly asked um, in the current capitalistic reward mechanisms is how much is actually enough? Or how much is enough for the individual as to make profit, for the company to make profit? Um, and this is what we never ask. And the third uh, requirement that we need for uh, an alternative economic reward model is that it uh, doesn't need 
any or very little regulation. And the reason for that is simple, that as soon as you have regulation, people try to cheat it. So the more you can um, create incentive structures that intrinsically motivate the person to not uh, to, to do well, uh, the better you, you are in the end off because you don't need to regulate, you don't need to persecute um, the people who uh, exploit the system. So yeah, how do we solve this? Essentially, what we definitely need to figure out is a way of breaking this binary thinking where we're right now in the world, where we think about, oh, capitalism is the only way or socialism is the only way to make like very extreme um, comparison right now. And to get more into something like, what is, what is the best part from capitalism that we can use? And what is the best part from socialism that we can use? So how do we take the incentives to, to grow to a certain level and combine it with the social responsibility that is at least baked into the values of socialistic structures. And we end up with a model called steward ownership. Um, what I dub as an investor reward model that protects your data and attention um, or an investor reward model for a regenerative economy. And essentially the two principles that this uh, model has is the first one, the company cannot be sold. So there's no exit. Uh, there's no market that can optimize for growth. There is no market that can rip out the purpose of the people running the company out of their hands. Like for example, if you are uh, doing an IPO with, with your company, then essentially uh, the market dictates from then, that point on what you as a leadership level will do. Like in the US, it's even so extreme that you can be held like financially liable um, as a CEO if you actively um, take actions if knowingly take actions that lower the profits of investors, which is fucking crazy. Like if we think about that this is even baked into the legal structures, then it, it, profit maximization is the only way forward for those companies. So essentially this mode of corrupting the purpose of the company and corrupting the ability of the company to be socially responsible needs to be removed. And that's um, what this first principle does. And the second principle is that the reward for investors and team members uh, happens through a capped profit share. And this is really important here. Like we need, uh, again, we need a, a way of uh, rewarding people who take a risk uh, and who spend an extraordinary amount of time into um, hopefully building something that makes a positive difference in hundreds of thousands to millions of people on this planet. And they should be rewarded uh, in a in a in a fair way. Um, but again, through introducing a cap on that on that reward, uh, you essentially ask this question: How much is actually enough? And how much is fair? And on the example of our company, we raised so far about four hundred thousand euros, and we still have one hundred percent of our shares, which is amazing. Um, and what we basically say to um, the 130,000 euros we got through investors uh, is that their seed and pre-seed investments are coming at the higher risk. Uh, so they will get a six to eight X return out of these 130K, make it easier for the calculation 100K. So we have effectively a debt to those investors of about 650, 700,000 euros. And what we do is we take 25% of our profits to pay back those investors. And what that means essentially is that after we deduct all of the expenses that we wanna put into the growth of the company, deduct the expenses that go to investors and team members, we end up with free capital that suddenly can be reinvested without lowering the total returns of people. And this is really a game changer in the end because it, it is exactly the kind of social responsibility that is enabled by not having a competitive relationship anymore between what the investor profits are and what the, let's say, society profits are by having a better, better supply chain or by the workers getting paid uh, sick leave better or um, parental vacations, et cetera. And this is also not something new. Like steward ownership has been around for over a hundred years and in, in its natural form, it's very related to 
uh, the German Mittelstand, which is the middle class economy in Germany, where there, which is the bedrock of, of why Germany right now is such a solid um, and socially uh, stable country. And if you think about companies that are more, like steward ownership has been more like prevalent until now in, in hardware domains like e-commerce or industry, um, but it's now slowly and steadily going into um, also online areas. So for example, Mozilla is a steward ownership company, uh, Buffer is a steward ownership company, Eposia, um, and the older uh, shards like John, John Lewis, the supermarket, um, and Bosch and Zeiss, uh, and Zeiss actually invented it. Zeiss are the guys who make the camera lenses on your phone, and Bosch, um, a lot of people probably know. So in the end, what I feel what happens through steward ownership is actually we're ending up in a win-win-win, or how the game be people call it an omni-win scenario. Because in this case, everyone will. The company, for example, is you get people with more skin in the game because they know they will not work just for investors' interests. They also work for their own interests and for their, for their own ability to be profitable. The company actually also uh, has through that a more long-term sustainability because uh, everyone knows if we're not building a profitable company that actually makes sustainable revenue and it's not just optimizing for the next quarterly results, uh, we, our likelihood that we're getting our money back at all and faster, like more speedy, uh, is higher. The company has also more freedom because it doesn't need to obey to stock market's interests um, as, as soon as it goes on that level of like scale in the end. And um, also because it has less pressure to grow at all costs. Uh, which a lot of companies uh, and a lot of startups actually suffer with after they raise their first money and then they become these com kind of walking dead companies which are kind of working and profit potentially profitable but are not interesting anymore for additional investors when they want to, for example, extend certain product lines, et cetera. And then they just become these walking dead, uh, which is kind of sad. Like these are the companies that work and they support a lot of people. And those companies um, have to make really difficult decisions that often kill those companies in, in the end. Um, no, here. Uh, it's also a benefit for the people. People are happier because they feel supported and they feel valued. Um, and value is uh, like the value of your contribution is a very active and conscious conversation that happens inside um, a, uh, a steward owned company because uh, you cannot just go and say like, oh yeah, because you're a founder or like you're the second employee, you usually get like 3% of the, of the company. You actually have to have a conversation about, hey, what are your skills? What is your risk that you right now take? Where do you, can, where do you contribute? Where did you contribute? Um, and how much time of your free time did you take? How much maybe less salary did you take in order to have a higher return based on the, like actually putting in money into the company, et cetera. And so uh, you have a multitude of um, aspects that you can take into account, making the people at the end feeling much more valued to work at a student owned company um, than working for a company that just optimizes for like company profit. And also the company takes care of them more because suddenly you have more, um, like profits or, or like expenditures that can be take can be taken to improve workers' lives, and in the end, everyone can still get fairly wealthy and should like if you build a company that actually helps millions of people, you should be rich. I don't I don't care, but I don't I don't see a point why you might be a billionaire. Like which is, which is um, I feel not in relation in most cases to how much uh, value someone generated in society. Somehow, uh, if I if I click, uh, it doesn't sometimes doesn't switch. The... Okay, um, yeah. There's also benefits for investors. Um, the steward ownership model historically has shown that those companies have a six times higher survival rate um, than VC funded companies. 
Um, and this is partly due to the fact that people actually with skin in the game, with the interest to make it profitable, um, much more likely like create a business that is profitable and that when it's profitable, it's much harder to kill or yeah, as opposed to a company that um, gets to a billion dollar valuation without making any profits and then falters because some competitor comes up. And also a benefit for the investor is in the end um, that through the six times higher survival rate, you uh, create on an entire portfolio an almost equally competitive uh, return rate um, than, than a regular VC, uh, uh, VC um, classic VC portfolio where you have only one out of 10 companies actually surviving. And also the, the profits that are made because they are returned gradually, like I said before, where the company pays back um, from its own profits, pays back the debt that it has towards the investor. Um, the investor also have, has the ability to reinvest that money straight away and not only when the company uh, has an exit or is again sold to another investor where they can sell their shares. The only loser here is greed, I feel, um, because you essentially remove, through the cap, you remove the ability for people being greedy. Um, they might be able to optimize that they can get their profits back faster, but um, they cannot optimize for getting as much out of the company as possible. If you're generally interested how to implement steward ownership, there is a couple of ways. Um, so again, the principles are you cannot be sold and you uh, cap the investor returns. And so you have a lot of opportunities to um, do that differently. The simplest one is a, a classic loan. It requires high trust and works with angels um, that uh, have like that want to invest and you really know them because there's less legal uh, ability for the investor to uh, force you to um, pay a, a, sh a share of your profits, for example. But for the beginning, you can open a, a classic limited liability company or a UG or a GmbH, whatever, uh, and then just use a loan, no problem. The second one uh, is a silent partnership, which is a, a way of, uh, it's a German construct, so I don't know if how, um, like how you can do that in other jurisdictions, uh, but a silent uh, partnership is essentially um, giving the investor uh, the rights to uh, claim some of the profits the company makes um, uh, on a legal on a legal basis, and has also more uh, transparency rights uh, in terms of what the company does. Um, then the full model uh, is the purpose model, which is a um, advocated by the purpose uh, economy folks. Uh, they're also in Berlin, which essentially is um, you give a veto share um, to a foundation and the foundation has the only purpose to veto any sale of shares of the company or veto a strong deviation on the, of the purpose that the company has right now, as opposed to where it was founded. However, again, um, whatever, uh, it, kind of governance structure you implement is, is another thing. Like important is that you can use, uh, uh, you can really make it solid that at least your company cannot be sold because of the, uh, the this foundation backing or blocking this ability. And uh, a bit more experimental, this is something that you, Gene, me have been talking about a lot. How do you use, for example, um, a crypto token with a fixed rebuy rate um, that essentially allows for a secondary market to occur, uh, but the secondary market would kind of um, like create a tunnel uh, of, of where profit can occur. So someone that, for example, uh, invested in a company, company 100K and should get out, should get back 500,000, um, when he sells it on the secondary market, he is not able to sell it for 500,000. Uh, he's maybe able to sell it for 200,000 so that the person who invests has the ability to get the rest of the 300,000 euros um, as, um, as their profit out of the investment they make. Um, yeah, but that's, uh, if you're interested in, in continuing this conversation, um, you can write me at ollie at worldbrain.io, but that's really early stages um, uh, to think about this. Um, 
and to really marry those two worlds of, again, the advantages that crypto offers, but also removing the, what I believe are more toxic dynamics that we've copied from the existing system that actually, in my view, is probably one of the reasons uh, why Bitcoin was created in the first place um, as one of the results of the exploitation of the current uncapped reward models. If you're generally interested in more resources to read about this, you can go to worldbrain.io slash steward ownership um, to purposeeconomy.org, uh, zebras unite, unite.com, or read a book, The Value of Everything by Mariana Masukato, which is an amazing book to understand um, or get to dive into um, how do we have a, a future economy where we have the ability to put a value uh, on, on contribution and where, where value is created in our society. Um, last thing, if you wanna change as a investor or a funder in any form, consider investing in steward owned organizations. Um, because the, the early stages of those companies is extremely difficult to raise money. It was a pain for us to do so. It was a lot of work um, that um, could be easier by more capital being available to companies that want to um, be more socially oriented, but still be a for-profit company, which we need. We cannot just go with just nonprofit or just for-profit. And if you're a team, um, do everything to keep your equity and control. If you can't keep your equity, try to keep control uh, and control in such a way that you have the ability to change um, the reward mechanisms later. Uh, don't get into the, to the situation that you have, that you give away uh, veto rights to certain investors, uh, which happens a lot actually, that uh, actually would enable investors even in a minority stake to get you out of your founder or CEO or CFO or whatever position that you hold as a, as a person um, uh, running that company. Um, yeah, um, I think there's one last slide. Let me check. Not very responsive sometimes. Yeah, that's it. Um, if you guys have any questions, we can start with that now and I check in um, onto the Q and A section. Yeah, thank you, Oliver. I was checking. Um, let's see if uh, somebody, you still have some time. Um, I was checking mm -hmm. for some reason the text on the Slido and the overlay to join the conversation didn't work. But I'm also making mm -hmm. something more long term. Uh, let me see. Right. So let me also add something more long term because I see that on Slido um people are also like asking if there is some more long-term conversation to have so i created this uh, telegram group that you can uh, just join uh, i just created it so there's just me and jacob <laughs> but um yeah we can just overlay and then people can we can repost the talks when when uh, uh when they get released by the VOC, the 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 technical infrastructure of the CCC uh, that will basically cut and put an intro and an outro into into the into the into our around our videos. Um, but yeah, it's always exciting. I really hope that um, this new way is also bringing uh, more people that are actually uh, struggling with like finding ways that are um, hmm, not as prescriptive and, and sort of, uh, um, I, I mean, I don't have anything against cooperative per se, but for instance, in Italy, which is the country where I come from, uh, that uh, legal design is also used to um, do bad things, you know, to kind of exploit loophole in funding and in like um, margin, like fragilizing the way some some of the the way you treat the your workforce. Um, so it's not all the good actually. 
And in Germany, I'm re hearing a lot of complaints about certain kind of uh, mm, mm, how do you say, uh, yeah, kind of constraints that the regulator puts on you. Uh, oh that, yeah. Yeah, like especially if you're a young organization, uh, being a cooperative is not necessarily a good thing because you um, you immediately give out the governance control and I mean the legal governance control to a much bigger pool of people that have to be put in alignment before they can be um, effective. And especially in the early stages, you need to be very like fast moving as a company and be able to make decisions fast. And um, especially if you found an organization with usually years of prior thinking and experience, as a founder, you have some level of uh, um, kind of thoroughness of thought tendentiously that, uh, that you need to be able to execute. And um, that is difficult if you uh, run, um, to run a cooperative. And actually a friend of mine um, this happened to is that his cooperative got overtaken by a board that has been elected by the overarching community um, and that um, was completely incompetent in, in, um, in running this cooperative. And in the end it faltered and went from a promising, actually a promising role model of being a cooperative in first place and for a business model that worked uh, to an organization that essentially is bankrupt right now. And so um, yeah. it's, it's kind of tricky, so. Yeah, it's super exciting what we are You're seeing. Muted. Oh, I'm muted. Yeah. In case you ask something. Yeah, I'm, I was muted on on Zoom, <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I think um, yeah, it's super exciting what I'm also seeing um, in the Web three space where there are um, few players that are trying to basically reduce the complexity of interfacing with the legal requirements that you have in each geography and in each sort of um, uh, regulation framework, uh, depending it's uh, if it's a different industry, different geography, um, and sort of providing interfaces for just normal entrepreneurs to allow uh, a much variety of stakeholders to to uh, to join the the shareholdership and uh, and the ownership in general. Um, one example is is Fair Mint. Uh, which they're doing a great job in US, Canada, I think now they're doing something. Um, but yeah, it's like on one side, it's like how you make it, hmm, um, let's say, illegal or paralegal. So something that is like not necessarily uh, proactively regulated by, by the regulator, but something that can work around what is the current situation and rapidly evolve. Yep. Um, yep, yep. And, in response to that um, cool so we will bring the the channel in in pause uh, Oliver uh, will also uh, join us in the next days uh, from for other events uh, as a commentator and uh, you will cheat with his brother Timmy uh, which is also gonna bring some fun to the channel I hope and um, we go a little bit in pause for uh, five m minutes and uh, we join with the next talk um, so stay with us. Bye, folks.